So um, thank you all for coming out on a Saturday morning. This is an unusual kind of time for us at ICA, and it's really amazing for us to be able to partner with the Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival. So thank you to them as well for, um, for letting us participate in your programming um, and collaborating with us on Michelle's uh, kind of vision for her show and the many different kind of dialogues that are coming out of it. So um, we're really excited to uh, be able to follow the conversation today with the screening. And I believe um, you'll have a 10 minute break around 12.15 and then uh, please do come back by 12.25, 12.30 uh, and we'll get the screening going with an intro from Michelle. So um, in the meantime, we wanna focus on kind of thinking about Michelle's practice and how she got to the show that she has here at ICA. And um, for those of you who may not be that familiar with her work, uh, giving a bit of an overview of, of how you came to make this extraordinary installation that's upstairs. So please do go upstairs afterwards and check it out if you haven't seen it in person, because the images we're gonna show you today do not do it justice in any way. Um, so I think we should just start off also with just like how we started a dialogue and, and met and how this show came to be. Um, I've been following Michelle's work off and on for about 20 years and then magically one day I heard that you were moving to Philadelphia uh, and uh, to take on the, a position in the Penn Design, the Stuart Weissman School of Art uh, faculty here and to lead the sculpture program. You were coming from Yale. Uh, we had some mutual artist friends. We immediately connected and started a dialogue and I kind of pounced on her and I was like, hey, what would you want to do if you could do something outside of a commercial context and maybe in a big space like our second floor galleries and the wheels started turning. <laughs> um, so we'll get to that in a minute, but maybe we should start about 20 years ago, <laughs> which is I know kind of funny, um, with this kind of iconic work of yours, Boy, from 1999, which many people would have seen in the Greater New York exhibition at PS1 in 2000, I believe. Could you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, so this work, I mean, I'm trying to think about this work in relationship to the work that you'll see upstairs, but um, I came from a background of thinking about feminist theory and semiotics and in terms of thinking about cultural signifiers. And then the other thing that I was really thinking about was how material could transform some of these very familiar cultural signifiers. <clears throat> and so for me, I was also really interested in this idea of figuration and how to represent the body without using the body or really thinking about um, just uh, this idea of desire in relationship to objects. And so um, I started experimenting with leather and um, because it's quite literal skin and covering objects with that. And, um, and then because it was, I wanted to think about this kind of full scale shell of, um, an object of extreme desire, even though there's this contradiction that this car is like a 1970s Honda. Um, so, the, so the whole thing is basically just covered in leather to kind of really think about um, these questions of fig figuration and desire, and even in terms of um, uh, feminist theory. So, um, so yeah, but it was also this real exploration of materials and pushing them so that they could do something else. And, um, and so this is actually soaked in, soaked in water and then the whole, the, the leather's soaked in water. It's animal tanned leather. Um, wait, that's not the, it's, it's tanned in a certain way. It's vegetable tan, sorry, excuse me. It is animal, but um, it's vegetable tan, so it allows it to just adhere to um, an active skin and wrap around the vehicle. I mean, one thing that really has impressed me in your work over the years is your kind of acrobatic approach to materials in a way. There's a kind of alchemical process where 
Um, hard things become soft. Materials that are used, employed in one domain get used in another. And I think this is actually a really great example of you starting to kind of figure that out in large scale and also playing with maybe masculinist symbols and making them soft. So a car, which we think of as a kind of hard machinery, making it a, sk a soft skin shell, um, which I think is, you know, you see even then a few years later in um, some of these works that uh, I actually first saw in a show that you had at LAX in 2010, I believe it was. Um, oh, something oh, around then. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, nine. Oh, nine. It was around, it was around then. Um, in any case, but, you know, kind of thinking about the way that you're unpacking symbols and how that then maybe leads later on to a kind of uh, approach to histories of sculpture. So I'm very interested in a kind of the way that you can also, I don't know, m chart a consistency in your in your practice, even if the form making starts to get a little different. So, yeah, I mean, I think with this body of work, this was in relationship to Star Wars iconography, or it start that was the starting point. Is that I was really invested in, I'm really invested in object making and sculpture, but also. I was making it, I feel like I'm still making it at a time where things are still very theory heavy and um, it's not, I, I'm really interested in the alchemy of how materials can be conceptual and, um, and so I was thinking about the way that we covet, like, because, you know, objects historically have been this kind of religious iconography and so I was thinking about Star Wars action figures as things that we as consumers covet and um, we learn to covet them as small children and so I wanted to get into this um, just the the psychology of these objects but then also do this kind of hybrid combination of things and so I worked with actually um, these images are quite small so you can't see this but this is actually the origin of the Death Star is it started as a, a toy object of the Death Star that opens into this, um, I think it's into the desert of Tatooine. And um, so I liked this idea of kind of taking an interior, like creating an interior space out of, um, out of a sculpture that's usually sculpture to me has always been, or how I was always thinking about it was through an, an exteriority. And so, um, so yeah, sorry, I could go on and on about this, but just to get back to these objects, it was really addressing like C-3PO as a, that transforms into a prophylactic, but is also this trophy and that it's a throwaway trophy. And I was just thinking about it in terms of thinking of myself as a female sculptor and um, just challenging these questions of making, of how um, I wanted to make something that almost was a throwaway thing and, and question this idea of um, sculptures as these really, um, as these phalluses, I guess. Yeah, but it's a kind of deflated phallus, right? right. It's emasculated. Um, you've exploded the Death Star. And right. I mean, I think also of this kind of, there is a strand of sculptural practice, especially if we think about like West Coast, like Paul McCarthy or Chris Berger, and there's a kind of boys and their toys kind of strand right. to it. So I think it's really interesting to hear you or see you taking the kind of the toys, the cars, the, uh, the Star Wars action figures, and then, you know, monumentalizing them through sculpture, but then completely deflating them. Um, but then also making them quite precious. I mean, gilded bronze is not exactly a throwaway material, too. Right. So they're right. actually these beautiful, seductive objects when you see them in person. But kind of, you know, maybe another work that is specifically kind of thinking about symbol systems and also talking to other sculptors in a way is uh, your self-portrait, Akira Revisited. Can you say a few words about that? Because this is also seems like a turning point in a way in, in, in the way that you're bringing yourself into the work that you don't normally do. Yeah, so I think there was a moment where I realized I was, I mean, it's, um, 
I think, I mean, a part of it was that I had a child and I, <laughs> and there was, um, I had this way of thinking that, you know, I talked to my grad students about that was very much conceptually smart in a way. And, um, and I think I, there was a lot of failure that I was experiencing in terms of making work. I had just left my job at Berkeley and, um, and, but also I was really kind of frustrated about being this female sculptor and um, didn't, was feeling a little bit trapped in the way that I was making things, which is why I think I gravitate towards this masculine way of making to just subvert this notion of what I'm allowed to make. And so this was actually in direct response to a Murakami piece of, you know, all those anime, um, anime figures that are quite sexualized. Um, and with this, I wanted to just do a kind of self-portrait of, of hair as this kind of signifier of female sexuality, but it's like, it's just the hair. So again, it's like removing the figure, but also casting it in soot so that it's actually just the remains from potentially from a fire. So it's like, so, so much of my work is about like taking things down and then reconfiguring and reconstructing it in the same way it is in um, ballast and barricades, I would say. So this was the beginning of like combining also more hybrid forms of uh, hair, um, female tresses with a kind of explosion with, um, just also this kind of abjectness that's similar in the C-3PO. Right. But also in a kind of more explicitly personal kind of yeah. register, because yeah. to also put yourself in the kind of aftermath of this kind of hypersexualized Asian right. female figure that is runs throughout Murakami's work. I wish I'd brought a comparative image, but uh, you know it wasn't uh, so, lo so long earlier. Uh, around this time, there were these giant uh, Murakami retrospectives, and this was a kind of dominant um, thing within sculpture and the market, and they were all about kind of sexualizing kind of right. Asian, Asian women, women anime specifically women. Specifically Asian women, and, um, and it was also this sense of entitlement that I felt that male artists had over object making that I think it felt like the, the vehicle for women was a kind of Eva Hess vessel. And I was just so frustrated with that, right. in a sense. Um, so it was really just trying, in a way, to take the iconography back and, um, I don't know, just to add a little bit of yeah. myself in it. So with that in mind, another one of the works that I also think of as a kind of transitional work that, for me, merges a lot of um, kind of important strands of your thinking as um, your board, which for me is also this moment where this kind of critique of maybe pop culture, masculine symbols comes together with your own interest in unpacking a history of sculpture and your own relationship to, to making. Um, do you want to say a few words about this? Because yeah, I mean, it's, so it's kind of obvious in many different registers, but also subtle. Well, this was kind of in tandem with Blue Angels that you'll see later, but um, I was thinking, because I was, I was really interested in these kind of vehicles in terms of the cars and planes and in relationship to almost either emasculating them or kind of adding a way for me to enter into that kind of vocabulary. And so I was really interested in making a skateboard that was, again, kind of a self-portrait at my scale in relationship to the body, but specifically um, my body, and a kind of wilted um, piece. So it was also, you know, it was um, this kind of um, post, really thinking about how to make objects post 9-11 and that things weren't, th that there was a, a kind of questioning to, to um, kind of the perfection of objects. And, um, 
And so I wanted to make this wilted skateboard that was a part feather, part um, thinking in relationship to the minimalist tradition, but have it actually make plywood act like paper. So this actually is, you know, you ha in this photo here, I have skateboards actually, but also I would have crumpled up paper as models and I would try and just score the plywood and it's lined with grip tape similar to skateboard, but kind of taking the process of these different industrial applications and exploiting them so that, um, I don't know, it could become something that has a familiar register, but then there's something wrong about it. Right. I mean, and also taking something that's often kind of rigid and hard and making it supple and yeah. feel organic in, in, in nature and... Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, literally. there's a lot of that. It's and, and that's something that you'll see upstairs in the show as well, that M Michelle is working with a lot of materials that are kind of, you would see as straight and hard, but then become soft and round. Um, and this kind of technique of, of making things kind of bend or wilt. Right. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of it is research in, in terms of how things are made. So every, every different project is about <coughs> um, <clears throat> how to, um, hold on for a second. Um, how to make sorry. materials like work <laughs> against themselves and do things they're not supposed to do. Yeah, and, and get really invested in the methodologies of it so that um, when you're seeing it as a viewer, you're recognizing that industry and that there's a recognition that I, I have to get so invested into it and also fail at it, but also try and make it do things that it's not supposed to do in order to, um, I don't know, o own it a little bit. I mean, also, I think there's um, something to be said, and I'll kind of go to the next image, but about kind of fabrication. And that's something that I think now more and more you see sculptors working on large scales, working with foundries. Um, engaging the kind of the tools of mass production and commerce to make uh, to make sculptures for art galleries, and so sometimes there's a, an assumption that the hand has been removed, that artists are not physically even making their work anymore. And so Michelle is always making her work, um, and that's something that I think is really exciting. That to kind of come on some of these objects and say, oh, they look like they were produced in a commercially produced or produced by a foundry or something like that, but then to know that it's actually her hand and her body that has been manipulating these industrial materials, um, which also within art history, there's a whole history of Finnish fetish of artists in the 60s who were working with the kind of materials of skateboard culture. So there's a little bit of that also when I look at your board, you know, I think about um, I mean, uh, of surfboards, you know, thinking about car culture surfboards that you're kind of also looking at contemporary language of, of industrial processes um, and masculinist culture. Um, but this is also a really wonderful segue into the Blue Angels series, which we have three of them upstairs in the installation. Um, and what you see on the right is a sculpture by John McCracken. So we're throwing around minimalism um, as a term, but just to know that there, it was kind of a, um, a, a group of sculptures, sculptors working in the 60s and 70s who were really interested in kind of taking sculpture to its kind of its essence, its kind of minimal form, thinking about the way the body uh, reacted in space to objects, but it was very male driven, it was very macho. Uh, and so it's really come to dominate a kind of history of sculpture in the present. And so also how to think about being a female sculptor resisting or in dialogue with or pushing against some of those histories. So um, can you tell us a little bit about where the Blue Angels came from and their kind of multiple yeah. meanings and how they're made? Yeah, I mean, looking at this John McCracken, I mean, the thing about minimalism is this kind of machined, um, machined fascist quality, which I really admire in terms of um, it's very specific in terms of the finish and the 
the conceptual parameters of actually giving it away to someone else, that the, the conceptual parameters are so defined so that someone else can make it. Um, but I think for me, this actually came from a totally other place of, um, you know, and also minimalism was about remove, like the real removal of the image. And I was really interested in actually, it came from a whole other place of um, having experienced 9 11 and having made these like really kind of smooth Finnish fetish uh, objects that were actually made in Italy and um, covered in, in different uh, skins. And um, they had a kind of, the, there was a, a, an approach to them that was um, exterior, exterior perfection in a way. And after 9-11, I was really questioning sculpture and considering this idea of that fragments or debris was kind of more representative of our time now in terms of um, of things exploding or in terms of failure. And so I was interested in making this kind of, at the same scale as a John McCracken, these are 10 foot tall um, aluminum powder coated pieces that are mirrored on the exterior. And the colors are specific in relationship to airline colors like Delta Blue or American Airline Red. And so I wanted it to have the same kind of structure as a minimalist John McCracken, but also um, evoke like airplane wings. Or I was also at the time looking at the morphology of crushed, um, broken wings of um, of birds. So when you know, just just the body language of birds falling in flight. And then also the other component was that I was so frustrated with the, also this idea of sculpture as a finished structure. Once you make the mold, you make this form and then you cast it. And so for this was this kind of movement towards me thinking about sculpture as a drawing. So all of these crushed pieces are just manipulated actually. I bend them and manipulate them on the floor with my body and so it's this dance. And often it's like if I crush it too much then it kind of loses a little bit of its, it then becomes overworked. So it's a bit of um, this performative thing that happens in terms of just, um, having the work register a certain kind of, the gesture of violence in a way, or of this wilted kind of defeat in a sense. Um, and so I wanted that to be in direct opposition to say a John McCracken that has no doubt at all or no no questions. And you could also think of someone like John Chamberlain, who's crushing these kind of large metal car parts and making these big sculptures. I mean, there's a lot of different things yeah. that it evokes. And I think that's another thing I appreciate about your work is that there's a specificity, but there's a mm. wide range of evocation that I think people can read into on multiple layers. And for me also, this image of you, like, I mean, these are large scale metal objects and Michelle is literally wrestling with them on the ground. And there's a way in which you're also kind of wrestling with a history of sculpture mm -hmm. um, when you're doing that, this kind of performance in your studio. But I, you know, I kind of, I bring that image to mind as a way to kind of remind you of these things being made by hand, by, a, by bodies, um, and not in a factory. And then, of course, the scale, the verticality evokes the body. Um, the ones that you'll see upstairs are called Blue Angels Paper Angels, so they almost look like paper. And so just remind yourself when you're looking at them that it's, it's heavy pieces of metal, uh, <laughs> which I think is you know, also in relationship to 9-11 of thinking of the kind of fuselage falling down. You know, you're thinking about this debris um, and then entwining that with kind of your sculptural practice, which is quite powerful. And Blue Angels being the military uh, planes that do the kind of acrobatic displays. So there's there's so many different references that you're you're kind of alluding to. And then of course taking it to architectural scale. And so this is a very key moment too. 
um, and also was very key in our thinking about getting ready to do the show here at ICA in our 30-foot ceiling space, um, which, you know, maybe before this, you were known for these more human-scale, delicate uh, objects, and you here you have something that is at architectural scale and kind of taking some of the similar premises to um, be kind of enorm enormous or gigantic. Is there anything you want to reflect on with this piece? Or? Yeah, I mean, this was, uh, this was a turning point in the sense mm -hmm. that I said to myself, I don't want to do public art because um, this piece was massive, and um, don't and say that out loud. You never know who's right, in the audience. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, but in the sense of um, thinking about, I mean, what was great about this piece is that people, as I was installing it, people who weren't in the art world would come by and say, "Oh my God, this looks like an airplane wing," and um, it, and it was at that scale. It was thirty feet high, and it would reflect. Uh, the surroundings, and um, so at night it was black, and, and uh, in the daytime it would reflect the sky, but um, I think some of it was like, some of the things that I've been thinking about in sculpture is how to think about making an impact three-dimensionally without creating so much volume, and um, or um, through a line, which is what I was thinking about in terms of ballast and barricades. And this became this uh, thing that was site-specific to the Bass Museum, but was also very much dropped down into that space. And, um, and, I, and I've been really thinking about th this site specificity of how yeah, how how you can create an experience through manipulating the 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 range of where a viewer goes in in a space through um, through something like say scaffolding or through structures that appear and disappear at the same time, which is probably a good segue into smoke clouds. Smoke clouds exactly, and also a work that is really responding to the political, but is so rooted in material explorations. Um, I want to kind of speed us up a little bit so we can spend some, some yeah. time in the installation, but can you say a few words about this? Because this, you know, is evoking the smoke after 9-11, the kind of the clouds, but also thinking about, you know, the protests with tear gas. And I think that there's something, there's a tension in these works that relates so, so much to some of the language of protest that you're investigating in your current work. Yeah, so I made these in the summer where the, where the when the Ferguson riots were happening, but this was an idea that happened long before because I was so struck by the World Trade Center with the billowing smoke for days. And uh, I wanted to make a sculpture of a smoke cloud, but, and you know, there, there are lots of different kinds of sculpture out there, but the material always drags it down because smoke is so ephemeral, and then it becomes a thing. It, like, if you make a smoke cloud, it becomes an object that has nothing to do with the, this, this moment post-violence, you know, post-explosion of just this smoke that's uh, billowing and evaporating, and so this, kind of happened by accident because I was I was moving a, a glass piece in this house when I was teaching at Yale up in Connecticut and there was a puncture in the glass and there was a moment where I could see the material of the silver nitrate and um, so I experimented and I went to PPG and talked to their chemists and asked them how can I make this like a cloud, <laughs> or how can I, um, and yeah, so I stumbled upon accidentally leaving out these pieces of glass out in the sun for a while, and when I poured silver nitrate on it, it just, something weird happened, and um, it had, um, the UV light had contaminated 
the way that the silver nitrate was um, going through it. But anyway, that's too much information. No, but no, it's, I think it's really interesting in that it kind of shows your, your kind of alchemical process and the kind of experimentation that you go through as a sculptor. But I think these are interesting too because they're on the edge of visibility. They're as delicate as you could possibly be. They're both kind of mirrors and things you can see through. How do you capture smoke? How do you capture this thing that is so transitory? Yeah. And, it, and it also, I think, leads very well into, uh, this is, for those of you that have seen the show, or if you haven't, this is really the entrance to the exhibition, and, and in some ways, the. F uh, in my mind, uh, a very key piece, a kind of a keystone in a way, um, and framework for how you enter the show. Uh, so it's an older piece from 2014, Halyard, and when you approach it, coming up the ICA mezzanine steps, it looks like an architectural column, but it also, if you know Michelle, you're like, well, maybe it's a minimalist sculpture, and then you kind of hear some noise, and you go around, and then all of a sudden you realize that it's a flagpole. And there's a, a rope that's kind of moving and suggesting movement of a flag, and it really looks like there's a flagpole going through the roof of ICA, but you just can't see it. And there's a, um, a very sophisticated soundtrack that's around you that's uh, the sound of a waving flag that slowly gets more and more aggressive over time until it's very violent. And there's this way in which you're, you're removing the imagery makes it even more of a violent gesture, because it could be any flag. It doesn't have to be the American flag, but it is. it somehow speaks to this kind of you know, really violent rise of kind of nationalist tendencies and, and populism that we've seen all over the world. And for me, it kind of foreshadows that. And then some of the your interest in thinking about this question of um, violence and the absence of figuration. So what do we, we don't even need to see it, but it's this pervasive um, kind of sound cloud <laughs> in a way that will follow you into the exhibition, just even in the background. Yeah, I um, I made this piece after I had made some flag pieces where it was these SOS flags made out of uh, lead, um, which is this piece, and um, and I decided it's like I'm actually not interested in the representation of power. I'm interested in how how power is psychologically inserted, asserted into the landscape, and so. Um, and as I started thinking about it, you see flagpoles everywhere <laughs> in, in terms of asserting a certain kind of nationalism or, um, and those aren't necessarily bad things, but it was the way that, um, that architecture, um, I was thinking really about how architecture or even a kind of cultural dominance controls us and controls the way we move. And um, so, so yeah, so that piece was like, okay, I'm gonna actually remove the flag and give the illusion of the flag through sound. And, um, and I worked with a sound designer who made the sound just kind of sculpturally move through a space. And in, a few, in two other spaces, it was, it, the speakers were pretty, distant from each other, so the sound would really move through different parts of the space. And here it has a kind of different effect because when you go upstairs, you'll see this precarious looking installation and at times you'll hear this rustling and think, oh my gosh, is something moving? Is it gonna fall down on me? So it, has, it takes on even a different tone within the exhibition, but if you look around within the installation, you're going to see a lot of kind of wilted flags mm -hmm. that are kind of have right. lost their kind of power or virility. Um, but another work that's in the show is Throne, which for me also seems, you know, a little a little prescient in our, our, you know, current transition of, moment of transition of power and how we're thinking about authority. Um, but also then how you're connecting that again to another histories of sculpture. This is always some tension that I, I, I really appreciate in her work going between sculptural histories but then also thinking about the socio-political terrain that we're in. And so these kind of delicate lines might think about something like Giacometti. And in terms of influence, we should mention that you studied with Jackie Windsor. Do you want to say anything about that? Or? Yeah, so uh, 
I studied with Jackie Windsor when I uh, got my MFA at School of Visual Arts. And, and um, maybe not everybody knows who Jackie Windsor yeah. is. Uh, do you want to? Just probably to say that there, there were there. It wasn't just men in the '60s and '70s making sculptures. There were also women who were pushing back and critiquing through other kinds of material explorations, and mm -hmm. who were in direct dialogue with, with that. So I think that's also something that must have seeped into your own, kind of yeah, I think student so. life. And you know, here we are at Penn, where where Michelle is uh, a pedagogue, and um, you have, you know taught in so many university settings, Yale, Berkeley, where you led the sculpture program. Um, and this is a huge part of, you know, maybe not your practice of making, but your identity, I think, as an artist. And I've heard so many students over the years, um, you know, say how important you were to them or the dialogues that they had with you. And I'm, I'm curious, just because we are, you know, he sitting here, um, across the street from your sculpture lab, <laughs> um, what you know, what teaching has meant for you in the same way that maybe being in dialogue with um, Jackie was for your practice? Yeah, well, Jackie, she, I mean, what's interesting about Jackie is she talked about like shamans and gurus, and I was always a little bit. Um, um, a little bit reticent about her, just her approach to it, but as uh, over time, I realized that, and especially looking at her work, like this work, uh, it's, it's, uh, it looks small, but these are real, these are enormous logs that are then tied together with twine. And so she's working in this minimalist uh, approach, but with all of these like, hippie organic materials and it has at a time when guys are making yeah. cold metal boxes right. and things right. like that and it had such a drama and a presence to me that was really quite powerful um but and it was also just just the, these combinations of materials was just very different from thinking about like a, you know i always just think about Eva Hess in the way that there's a kind of casting and working with the same material. And um, so, yeah, and in terms of uh, teaching, I mean, I think it's the teaching that has really, I mean, my students are the ones who are pushing me in terms of the way that I think. And uh, so it's become, I used to be really reticent about how I identify teaching into my practice, but now it just feels very much of this holistic thing where there's this real exchange, and um, and it's, it's just really exciting. It, it keeps me present in a lot of ways. Great, and we had a lot of, you know, even grad students from Penn who were engaged in helping install the installation, right. and so yes. it was really amazing seeing you also working with a younger generation of artists, you know, in dialogue with your own production. Yeah. But, you know, maybe on the topic of materials, Arta Povera has come up a lot as well, and this idea of a poor material, we don't need to get into kind of deep into it, but just thinking about there was a group of sculptors working in Italy also around the same time when artists maybe in the US are working with these kinds of cold fabricated materials, but in Italy they're also kind of, um, there's a kind of a socio-political commentary going on through another use of every the everyday form. So you, you specifically wanted to kind of bring up this Anselmo work, the sculpture that eats, which, you know, is this wonderful kind of, you know, stone and lettuce <laughs> um, kind of sculpture. Yeah, which, so it's a very simple premise, yeah. which is when the lettuce wilts, that stone that is attached to it will drop into the sand. Mm -hmm. And so I liked this relationship between materials and the way that they could have narrative agency. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking a lot about that in terms of yeah, this next body of work. Right, and so this is really um, the, in a way, I think the genesis also of where we started the conversation specifically about how to approach the show upstairs. So thinking about that Anselmo work, if the lettuce wilts and the stone drops, 
uh, Michelle had been really exploring these ideas of tension, balance, and counterbalance uh, within kind of sculptural, um, I guess, the physics of sculpture, but then also thinking about how those might extend to political systems and precarity. So this exhibition from 2018, House of Cards, um, has of course this double meaning. You can think of uh, you know children making a you know a house of cards, literally out of a deck of cards. But we also have the kind of the political meaning that's implicit in that of a kind of a system that's on the brink of collapse, uh, not just because of the you know the TV show. <laughs> yeah. So um, the other piece that was shown was I had made Throne, which uh, was made around the time of the election, and um, it was really thinking again about um, iconography of power and the throne being this, this really quite vulnerable thing that's covered in lead, but also I, I painted it in gold, and, but it has this petal-like quality so you could peel it away and see actually that the gold was actually this industrial material of lead. And so I use that same technique of wrapping these structures, these kind of skeletal structures of scaffolding and have them be supported by um, rope that we had twisted and made ourselves. I, we made a jig and was twisting it. Um, and uh, actually, if Raul is in here, Justine assisted me with twisting the rope. Yeah, and and it was so great because um, it was just it just felt really good to be making rope out of steel, and um, and to just be using this jig that we had welded and that we're now we're getting to sculpture talk and just twisting it because what it does is it creates its own its own tension and own form and so we would basically just riff off of that and start making these sculptures in relationship to the shape of the rope and the way that it could support scaffolding that was leaning on it very, I, I mean, they're all structural in the sense that they all, there's, there's nothing, there's no smoke and mirrors. They're all holding it, it, they're holding each other up. And so that was really important is that they're delicate and, and they could be on the brink of collapse. But um, but there's this impossibility to them, and they're also like counterbalanced by pieces of rubble that are just holding it, so it doesn't, so it acts as as a counterweight. And they're all in individual sculptures that are kind of connected together. It's it's hard to look at that this yeah. pe this image for me because the work you kind of have to experience, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's so many details that you can't see. But another one of these key works that grew out of that was Barricade, which also has this premise of holding itself up. So this sculpture that is literally just, you know, willing itself to stand, uh, and the barricade having this kind of doubled function, the rubble being something that maybe has fallen off of a building or you could pick up and throw. You're using a kind of a military-grade paracord. So there's a lot of kind of symbolism that's also just tied into these seemingly simple materials. Yeah, so you can't see that this is, well, if you've been in the show, that this is one of the ropes that we twisted that's basically just holding up the barricade. And the counterweight is this piece of rubble that I found. <laughs> There's a lot of rubble in <laughs> Philly. And um, it's plentiful. At first, I was like, oh my god, there's rubble. And then you see more rubble. Um, but, um, but it just became this moment of, for me, of thinking about the rock that you could hold in your hand that could actually be also in relationship to the body, which is important for me in sculpture, that you could throw as an act of protest. And, I was thinking about that in terms of House of Cards, like how, um, how to create all these elements that could act in a crowd to form a kind of protest, but in a whole other language. But it's also the ballast in this respect. So right. the, the show upstairs, Ballast and Barricades, 
we'll get to the ballast in a second that's upstairs, but I think this is almost like, in retrospect, almost like a sketch for the framework for the show. Right, right. Um, and just to kind of talk about the importance of drawing in our remaining minutes so that we can we can t get into the, the, um, the exhibition upstairs. I mean, these are all in the exhibition upstairs, but the installation that we commissioned, this newer work, Continuous Line, I like to point out because when you see it, it's gonna look again like a kind of a fabricated cast thing, but it's something that you've actually constructed in your studio, but then coded to make it look like it's this seamless mm -hmm. thing, but it really shows the way she's thinking about forms bleeding into each other. So a twig becomes a barricade, becomes a chain link fence, becomes a flag, and then it becomes a rope which the installation upstairs really began from a series of drawings. And for uh, those, those of you who've heard me talk about this show before, um, it's, you know, this has been one of the most, I think, ambitious installations that I've had the pleasure of working on uh, in terms of an artist who's really wanted to take over our building and do things that, uh, you know, it's, the building is also not supposed to do. So we had to engage a structural engineer because there's a lot of heavy things that are hanging. Um, it was a complicated three week install, which we usually don't have artists on site for that long. And so imagine showing this preparatory sketch to a structural engineer and saying, help us. <laughs> They laugh at you. <laughs> so it was also such an amazing process to kind of see this come into real physical form. Um, and then in the, in the end, see the drawing kind of relationship of drawing and importance of the way you're following lines in space, but then also on paper. Um, and then also figuring out how to convey that to the structural engineer <laughs> along the way. Um, in terms of some of the references for this show, I think we talked a little bit about you know, Philadelphia is a city that is being torn down and being built up. There's a rapid process of gentrification. When you moved here, um, this you can see the photo on the right. Michelle was walking around the streets and really seeing the city crumbling and seeing, you know, the process of what was that was happening to the built environment. But if we're thinking also about um, you know, masculinist histories of sculpture, there's also a way that that extends to the built environment and structural systems. So looking at it literally through a language of construction um, and construction material. So I like to just kind of bring up these other images for reference. So up on the top, the kind of bamboo scaffolding that you might enc encounter throughout Asia that might look very delicate, but is actually incredibly strong. And you'll see it running up skyscrapers at times. Um, and then also on the bottom left, uh, an image from the recent Hong Kong protests, so literally a kind of a mass of barricades that has been thrown up and kind of repurposed against uh, the authority figures. So also thinking of barricades as having this double, double function to them. Uh, but these are the c some of the images and sketches that we were looking at as we were developing the show. Um, and in the process of the installation, also just to kind of give a shout out to here's Michelle with some of the crew members and assistants. So uh, we have a couple of Penn MFA graduate students who are in the trenches with you and kind of, uh, it was a whole process of running back and forth between different studios. We engaged the Annenberg Theater Studio, uh, Theater Set Building um, Studio for the whole summer, which was amazing for us because we were working on such a large scale that exceeded the size of your, your studio at Penn. And um, from the very beginning, Michelle was saying, I want there to be a ballast to this barricades. And I, I think I need to have a big, big hunk of a building. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about this? Because when you, when you go upstairs, there's, this, there's a, an actual piece from a building that was uh, from a demoed up in the Northeast. And it's over, over a thousand pounds. Um, and it looks light as could be. Yeah, I th I wanted this uh, fragment of a building to act as the r how the rubble acts in a lot of my work, where it acts as the counterweight to to suspend um, this house of cards and um, or this scaffolding system, and so um, so. We had been working with demo companies, hoping that something would come, and there was a moment where I didn't think it would happen, and then there finally was 
a demo company that said, okay, I have the building for you. And then we came and they were great about, we were like, we want this part of the building. And this is actually an iPhone photo that I just sketched and sent to the demo guys of, we want this part. Um, and I got it in a text saying, this is coming to ICA. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to tell my registrar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is and great. Kind of Cause they, the building and was like in a, Kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah. I have footage of them throwing it yeah. off the building, but we it was great the in the sense that I there say were lots it was of like, okay, let's do this um, every step of the way. But um, yeah, and I mean, I think it was also just in response to seeing things falling and rising, and and also just thinking about all of the socio-political things that are happening of. Um, what happens when things fall and when they rise um, in terms of all of these other social structures. So um, I wanted, I, I think I just wanted there to be this moment where it's like uh, this moment of impact, I mean, of things, things are falling apart in a sense. And I think it's no coincidence that infrastructure is such a big topic in our society right now at a moment when our you know, political system is in, is in a, a very, you know, kind of tenuous state. So the precarity of the built environment also relates to the precarity of the political system. Um, so just some details, because um, again, this is not really representative uh, in photographs, but the kind of the language of construction that Michelle is looking to. So there are barrack, everything that you see in the show is al almost every single thing has either been made by hand or manipulated in some way. So you'll see chain link fence, the chain link fence was all handmade. The barricades that you'll see are all warped and they're all made by hand. They're individual pieces of, of thin wood that have then been soaked, bent, and then put back together. There is kind of found scaffolding, but it's been um, manually rusted uh, and then professionally finished on the other side. There are steps and ladders that lead to nowhere that can't be accessed. So here are just some, some details. And then here's the, the bigger view of the installation uh, that looks kind of very polite in photographs, but was you know, really kind of violent and intense in the installation process and I think at moments when you're standing within it. Yeah, I really encourage everyone to actually go into the installation because um, I wanted, um, I wanted everything to basically have this fulcrum above you, um, like in a way a tornado where everything is, just really perched on these delicate, um, delicate strands of rope, and um, and that the that the fragment is the thing that's also preventing it from coming down. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there's this. Uh, I wanted there to be these registers of everything, kind of twisting and turning and also um, rising up and coming down. And there's also, um, when you go inside the installation, which I really encourage you to do, uh, you will see this intricate system that, that Michelle has made throughout the, the installation. And it's, you can't find a broken line. Don't touch it, but if you were to touch it, the whole thing would move, the whole, the whole installation. Everything is actually interconnected. So you have to imagine her bringing this kind of all of these different pieces into the installation and then welding in space up high and making this big intricate system, uh, which all of a sudden one day we walked in and it had just become like the drawing in a way which was a really incredible moment. And then also working that, you know, Michelle had to balance the kind of the safety needs uh, with what the building could handle. Uh, I found out that we can, we can hang up to 10,000 pounds from our ceilings, so we were good. Um, <laughs> but we almost got there, I think, with all the scaffolding. Um, but then also, you know, the concerns of you as viewers, how you navigate it, but also making it feel quite natural, but then also realizing the vision that you had from the very beginning. So it was really an incredible feat. And also, I think, um, once you kind of also see some of the older, the, 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 the previous sculptures that are also installed up there, you see how she's really taking some of these premises of 
balance, counterbalance, and the kind of socio-political inflection to uh, just the next level, and it was so ambitious. So it was such an amazing process to work with you on it. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I mean, this was a hard install for everyone. And um, we walked in there with parts. And uh, we had three, like ICA gave us three weeks, and I had, I had made models. Um, but none of it was entirely planned. And so a lot of it was responding to the space um, and suspending things up on scissor lifts. So, um, so yeah, there are things that um, had to be structurally safe, which, um, which I resisted <laughs> in the sense that I wanted there to be this kind of sense of danger. Um, but then in terms of, um, yeah, all of this is really heavy stuff, but I also wanted it to have a legibility of things having a certain kind of um, um, uh, logic and, um, and in, in relationship to creating my own scaffolding system that could actually kind of create this moment of hope instead of what, what the house of cards came from me feeling such despair about just this, the, the, cli the political climate. And in a way, it became my way of sculpturally trying to get out of it. So then there are things like, oh, like if everything could be balanced on um, rubble, then like j just, g just going through this process of play in order for it, to, in order to make sense of it. And so in the same way, it was, this of entering the space and being like, okay, what, how can we, how can, what can we do with this space so that these, the scaffolding kind of creeps up towards the wall and is specific to the wall, but is also just, it could collapse. Right. And um, so I, I hope that feeling, th it could collapse, but there are these moments of where it's just like that is so idiosyncratic and weird that that's happening there. Um, like the broken ladders and the suggestions that scaffolding could t just be tilted and supported by these impossible ropes. So, um, yeah. Do we have time for questions? Okay, we can take maybe one or two questions if anybody has a burning one, or we could also invite people upstairs to check out the show. We had to work with the structural engineer to make sure things were weight appropriate. Um, they have a magic way of being able to estimate weight by looking at how many bricks and knowing kind of roughly scaffolding. So we didn't have a scale per se, but they were like, that's like 1,200 pounds, that's 1,000 pounds, that's 800 pounds. So they they had a sense of what it was, but it was it's heavy duty stuff that magically feels very light and airy and, you know, there's this tension between playfulness and violence, which I think is 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 really just yeah. I think it, again, it's like there. trying to resist these the metal material and have it look like a line drawing. And so um, so yeah, so my assistants would work off of drawings in order to bend the metal in a certain way. But a lot of yeah. So it's um, it was hard on my assistants. I have to say, it was hard on the whole install team. Because, but very rewarding. In yeah, the end. <laughs> yeah. Just because we would, I would, we would be in the scissor lifts, and I would say, "Turn it one way." And then you would hear loud creaking metal. And then I'd be like, metal. "Well," <laughs> and so it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't. But um, so in that sense, I really encourage you to experience it with your body. In, in the space and go go into the installation. But the large scaffolding that you see in the show really is, I mean, it's perched on these tiny, on these relatively tiny legs compared to the system that it's in, but everything is being supported from the top. So the suggestion being also that the building is somehow counterweighting or holding down this intricate, delicate, yet heavy system. Yeah, there's this interconnectivity that, um, yeah. 
that I wanted to make clear that everything's connected and affects each other. Which also has a political metaphor itself. And is that maybe a nice place to, okay. Yeah. The, the actually idea of the whole installation is when you walk inside there is not to feel safe. <laughs> That was the actually the whole, uh, pretty much the idea you yeah. wanted, but it has to be safe yeah. because of the institute. But actually, you don't want it. I mean, I keep thinking about, I mean, uh, someone came in recently, the gates, uh, I was told, that the security guard came, told me, was like, oh, the, um, a group from California came, and they felt like it was about what they were experiencing with all the fires and that um, I am thinking a lot about the phenomenon of disaster like that, that really comes from that specific place of um, starting from 9-11, say, and how it just ripples outward in terms of this feeling of, um, yeah, un unease and, um, yeah, and that, that things are broken, that there's a system that's kind of broken and yet um, yet it's but we're we're in it and we're supporting it somehow <laughs> but um, so yeah and and so I'm thinking about uh, Alex mentioned about how I'm trying to um, what I can't I can't remember the words that I used at one point was trying to embody violence within the work, and so I think that's why I have to manipulate everything with my hands, It's and why, like even when we were bending the boards, and I think I was somewhere else, and uh, my assistants were sending me photos, I was like, just break the barricades, like don't be, like when you twist them, like go ahead and aim to break them, because I didn't, I, I need there to be a certain kind of attitude with the work, where it's like just push it, so, like don't don't treat it like art, so that it can, it can, it can hold that history of violence. And so I think that's why we're talking about like how these things are made and how they're holding the tension. Is that that's important for me when you're f physically seeing it and physically making it that it have that kind of tension within it. So hopefully, like whatever we've said doesn't matter that you'll experience it when you see it, I hope. Don't worry, it's still dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, that's, that's, what, that's what the whole idea was, is like walk inside there and feel like everything is falling to you and feel unsafe and like feel that fear of being inside, but now you ruin the whole situation because you tell us it's all welded. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, um, yeah, everything looks so delicate, and then suddenly you see this, like, scaffolding system that's actually industrial, and you see that it's actually just in the air, and hopefully those are the moments where you're like, oh, wow, this actually is, is not, uh, it was important to have those appropriated industrial things be there, and if you go and you look at one side and you rotate to the back, it's all, like, industrial safety safety yellow and then when you move to the back it's all rusted because I wanted there to be this experience of what you see is not what you know and it's the same with the the blue scaffolding that's a Porsche it's actually a, the same color as Porsche and move to the back and it's rusted so um, and your barricades are NYPD blue right and then there's construction orange so there also is very specific material references that you're working with. Right, but all the flags are wilted, and so, um, and one thing that someone said that I thought was nice was that they were talking about continuous line and how it kind of has this Iwo Jima quality to it, <laughs> where it's like whole, so it's, uh, was just thinking about how much I could make in terms of an experience through the minimalism of a line rather than um, through volume asserting a position, but through line. And so that's, that's really what I was thinking about. Thank you so much for your talk. Oh, okay.
We're trying to figure that out. You're not the first person to ask. The question was, what's going to happen to everything upstairs at the end of the show? Um, I hope that somebody else would like to um, maybe exhibit this in one iteration or another. But I think that's also one of the special things that ICA can do is provide a platform for an artist to create something that isn't necessarily a discrete object that's to be bought or sold. Michelle was able to push her practice and kind of take it to some next place that is was really in response to our architecture. So it'll never yeah. be the same again, yeah. even, if, uh, even if it does go somewhere. Alex said a great thing, which, you know, is an artist's dream, which is don't make gallery work. Um, make work as ambitious as p as possible, so that you know you can be really excited about the piece. And um, yeah, and so I see I encourage that. And and even you know when I came in with those drawings, Paul Swenbeck was like, "I trust you. I know it's all in here." And that's kind of rare when that <laughs> happens, because <laughs> up until the end, he was like, "Okay, Michelle." We're good. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, but it, it is going to have to be stored somewhere. That's a good question. I think you're going to need a bigger storage locker. Right. So, um, yeah. I think I'm getting the signal that we're at the end, but I really encourage you all to please go upstairs, see the show in person. Images don't do it justice. Our elevator is right here, right up to our second floor. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thanks for coming. And thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you.